Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. And today I want to tell you about a field that is emerging of what we call the physics of AI. And we're going to explore a bit the intersection about what are new physics that can help accelerate the future of computing and the future of AI. Uh, this is where I work. This is the research headquarters of IBM. It's about 45 minutes north of uh, Manhattan. So if you look at, I mean, it will be hard to overstate the importance that computation has had in the current uh, you know, advances in AI. And this is uh, a roadmap of what's likely to be in front of us. Basically, what we are seeing is that we're seeing 2.5x improvements per year in the performance of the hardware uh, that we can utilize, say, to train deep learning models. And you're seeing this plot uh, two colors, right? You see these uh, purple uh, colors. This is you know, what I would say is a GPU roadmap. And what you're seeing beyond the 2020 uh, time frame is the space where new physics and new devices are going to be required to, peak, to keep this progress, is that just architectural innovations may not be enough. Now, the roadmap to be able to do that it starts with, you know, we have the current paradigm of having accelerators like GPUs. Beyond that, you know that there is a lot of emphasis around approximate systems and approximate computing where we can reduce the precision in the architectures of these systems to be able to do this efficiently. You're seeing a second row where we're now talking about the introduction of novel devices. So, you know, things like uh, analog devices and, you know, and memory devices that we bring very close to the computing element to be able to achieve forms of acceleration that we couldn't do today. But, and while we're doing a lot of work uh, on that space, I want to tell you about the bottom row today. I want to tell you about the intersection of quantum computing and AI and show you some very recent results in this space. We all know that there is an intimate and very interesting relationship between the dimensionality that we have access uh, you know, in our algorithms, say neural networks, and our ability to do classification. To just give a trivial example, on the left-hand side, you see a set of dots. Some are light, you know, light blue dots and dark blue dots. And if I ask you to find a single line that was able to classify or segment the dark blue dots from the light blue dots, you couldn't do it, right? You would have to draw a circle or two lines. But we know that if you take that line and you just simply curve it, now it's easy to find one line that classifies the dark dots and the light dots. So the generalization of this principle is that we can have many, many, many dimensions. And what we do in neural networks is we find a hyperplane that classifies uh, two uh, sets of structures. So think now of this concept that we as a community have gotten used to the fact that we can do that with neural networks, right, to do classification. And what I want to tell you today it's a different high dimensional space that is going to be accessible through quantum computers. It doesn't look exactly like neural networks. It's a different space. But we're going to explore today whether this has power in doing classification tasks. Now, what is unique about this quantum AI network is that it has a special property. And the dimensions inside of this quantum AI network would be exponentially costly to model with a classical computer. So what is this property? This property is something called quantum entanglement. And that is really the key resource that is available to us in a quantum computer that does not exist classically. So what is it? If you go back to your physics days and physics classes, you remember you learned something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And simply stated, what it says is that you know, we have learned that if we have a particle, we cannot know with arbitrary precision both its position and its speed. It's really its momentum, but it's its speed, right? So if I know perfectly its position, I know nothing about its speed. And if I know perfectly its speed, I know nothing about its position. So consider the following thought experiment to give you some understanding of what is behind uh, entanglement. So let's say we take two particles and we entangle them. We, we create this property that I'm trying to describe. And now what we do as a thought experiment is we separate them and we send them to the two ends of the universe. Now what we're going to do is taking one of the particles, an experimenter is going to go there and is going to decide which aspect to measure, either its position or its speed. 
Now, what is very fascinating what happens is that the moment we do that, the act of performing that measurement in one of the particles that is one of the extremes of the universe, it would mean that we would instantaneously know either the position or the speed of this other particle that is on the other side of the universe. Now, that is mind-blowing. And one or two things are going on. Either communication across the ends of the universe is faster than the speed of light. We think that that's very unlikely. Or a quantum description of the world is much more complex than everyday experience tells us, meaning we're violating a principle of locality. Somehow, we are sharing properties across vast distances in ways that we cannot explain classically. Now, to mimic that property that we know exists, if we wanted to mimic that classically with a normal computer, it would be exponentially costly. How costly? Let me give you an example. If you wanted to describe with our everyday computers what take two qubits, two quantum bits, that are entangled, that have this special property, and you say, well, let me represent that classically. Well, if you just had two qubits, it will take you 512 bits. You can see sort of the list. Yeah, by the time you have 35, you can still do it, 550 gigabytes, but it's an exponential. By the time you have 100 entangled qubits, you require more atoms than they are on planet Earth. If we devoted every atom on Earth to store bits, we couldn't represent what the entangled state of a 100 qubit machine would be. By the time you have 280, you need all the atoms of the universe to be able to do this. So this is the interesting aspect of a quantum computer, that we have these 2 to the n, where n is the number of qubits, paths that we can explore. And that's what we mean that it's exponentially costly to mimic it. OK, so I told you a special property that is unique in its character in its representation in quantum computers. All right, so now we're going to explore what you can do with it. So um, this is actually what a quantum computer looks like. So the first, second statement I want to tell you is that quantum computers are real. And after many decades of working on them, now we have small but working quantum computers. This is uh, an example of a quantum computer in the lab I showed you uh, in my first slide. And what you're seeing hanging from the ceiling is a dilution refrigerator. And the inside of a quantum computer uh, looks like this, which incidentally are the most beautiful computers we have ever built right, in IBM. So um, what you're seeing here is the wiring uh, that goes to the bottom of that canister where the quantum processor sits. Those are uh, superconducting coaxial cables because the input into a quantum computer of this kind are microwave pulses. That's how we send uh, the information in and out. And the inside, at the bottom of it, it operates at 15 millikelvin, which is 100 times colder than outer space. And, um, and at the bottom of it, we have this quantum processor where, that we also design and fabricate at IBM. So the power of it is that if you look at it from an information theory perspective, the potential of quantum computers is that in reality, what we have is we have easy problems that we can solve with classical computers. And there are classes of problems that are very hard to do classically. Right? So the most extreme versions of them are NP-HAR problems. And what quantum computing tells us is that it's the only technology we know where some problems of this character we could solve. So I'm going to show you some results around machine learning right now, which are hot off the press. So here's the experiment we have done on a simulation, on a theory, running on a quantum computer. We have taken a training set that you look on the left-hand side. You have black dots and golden dots, a very simple experiment. And we're going to use entanglement to encode the many different attributes of this form of supervised machine learning. In the end, I'm trying to do the simple task of classifying what's a gold dot and what's a black dot. This is a function I'm trying to learn, right? Those were my training set. I don't have this function fed to the computer. But in the end, I want to know that when black dots appear in the black areas, the, the computer classifies them appropriately, and so on. So the way a quantum algorithm works is you put the computer in a superposition of states first. Then you encode the problem by altering the face of these states. And the magic is the interference of these states to produce the result you want. So I won't bore you the details of how you code it. But basically, is you prepare this superposition. You map the training data in this quantum feature map. 
and then you train the quantum classifier. And now here's a moment of truth. So this is the data to be classified. It's never seen it before. And here's the result. The result is that using entanglement, the more entanglement I have, here's an example of entanglement depth one, it improves my classification accuracy to what we could do when I use the quantum computer without entanglement. So I've shown that a property that is exponentially costly to model on a classical computer is beneficial in the task of classification. So that's an important first step in the direction. And I'll close by telling you we have three working quantum computers available for free on the IBM cloud. Just to give you a flavor, just in five days, these are the number of experiments that people are running on a real quantum computers, not simulations, running on real systems all over the world in just five days. So um, over 80,000 users, over 4 million experiments have been run, over 70 papers have been written uh, using the tool. Uh, QuizKit is a means to write. You know, it's kind of an open environment for you to experiment and try this. And I really recommend that you give it a shot. And I'll close with this statement that our head of theory at IBM Research uh, said in a passing meeting, and it's become a motto for us. So when everybody, when, whenever we're talking with somebody else and they're not quite thinking about the new possibilities of what it means to exploit a quantum computer, he says, you're thinking too classically. And, uh, and I think that's a good motto to exploit quantum computing. Thank you.